happy Monday. So unless there's any questions about the assignments, let's move forward. And I forgot to change the date on this, um, but it is fall 2020. So what I would like to do is we'll start the unit on disinfection and we should be able to complete that this week. And what I've been trying to do is kind of move you through the treatment process. So before, dis before distribution, one of the last steps is disinfection. So we'll talk about water disease and disinfection. We'll look at disinfection regulations and just as a comparison, I'll give you, uh, we'll talk about disinfection regulations in the US and New Zealand um, so that you have a sense of how different countries approach disinfection. We'll look at the properties of different disinfectants and then these, what we call the CT concept in the US and disinfection design. So when we're looking at disinfection, we're looking at eliminating human enteric pathogens to a level that doesn't result in human disease. We're not, dis we're not sterilizing the water. <clears throat> the water may very well still have bacteria in it and likely will have bacteria. But the idea is that it doesn't have enteric pathogens. So this lists some of the different organisms that we look at controlling in drinking water systems. Okay. E. coli is an organism that is present in mammalian intestinal system. It is in every one of us. It's important in terms of maintaining an ecosystem within the intestinal system to ensure that you have proper digestion of food. O157 is a particular strain. So when we talk about um, <clears throat> Any organism, we talk about family level, we, and we talk about genus, we talk about species, and then we talk about strain. Most strains of E. coli are harmless. In fact, they're in many cases essential. The 0157 strain can be deadly. We'll look at this a little bit more. It produces toxins. Those toxins are pathogenic and can cause very serious disease and in some cases, um, death. Vibrio cholera is the organism that causes cholera. WHO, the World Health Organization, estimates that about 120,000 deaths per year are actually due to Vibrio cholera. There are a number of waterborne viruses. These include sorry. These include the adenovirus, hepatitis A and E, rotavirus, norovirus, and hexacle viruses. We're not gonna talk in any great detail about any of these, but as you can see, there are a number of these viruses that are <clears throat> waterborne. There are also protozoa. 
1993, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, there was a major storm event, a process upset, resulting in the distribution of water that contained cryptosporidium oosis. And this is the oosis right here. It's an extremely stable state of the organism. It resulted in approximately 100 deaths and over 100,000 people became sick. Giardia is also another protozoan organism. Um, Giardia and cryptosporidium both are two of the more commonly common waterborne diseases from drinking waters like on backpacking trips where they're not the water isn't properly disinfected and also from swimming pools <clears throat> amoebic cysts are also important as a waterborne disease and amoeba histolytica is an important organism, especially in um, <clears throat> the near the equator in these warm environments. It's part of the life cycle is in the snail. So actually one of the things that has been done to try and control this is to control the snail population. The other one that you may have heard of recently This is a sorry. Neglaria filari. This is the one that's referred to as the brain eating amoeba. It's actually harmless if it's swallowed. However, if it's inhaled through the, no <clears throat> through the nose, it gets into the nose nasal passages. From the nasal passages, it gets into the brain. And it is about 98% deadly. It's about 99% preventable. So if we can prevent it, we can easily prevent illness and, and death. But we have to make sure that we're preventing it. Now, we can ask the question, do we disinfect or not? And this question was asked um, back in 2018, I was doing my sabbatical in Christchurch. And in 2016, they had had a major outbreak in a village called Havelock North. It was caused by E. coli 0157. There were 5,000 5, that became ill, 45 hospitalized, and four deaths. As a result of that, the Ministry of the Environment mandated chlorination of drinking water systems. Christchurch was using groundwater. It had about 57 pump stations. It pumped water directly from those pump stations into the distribution system without treatment. No corrosion control, no chlorination. And as a result of a study, a study, mandated study that was done, the ministry said there are concerns about the piping network distribution system, partly because of issues resulting from the 2010 and 2011 earthquakes that hit Christchurch. So there were concerns about breakage um, in pipes, in some of the pump <clears throat> um, wells heads being below the flood zone, flood level. So they mandated chlorination. People went ballistic. Um, some supported it, but a lot didn't. Um, so 
we have this issue of do we disinfect or not? Um, their concern there was predominantly with disinfection byproducts and even more so the taste. Um, so you see this, this uh, the cancer risk and that really pertains to disinfection byproducts. Um, this question that was just asked is, so even if UV disinfection is done, it, must there be some sort of chlorination system? In the US, for surface waters, and we'll talk a little bit, we'll talk about this next, but in <clears throat> this, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, the surface water treatment rule, chlorine residuals are mandated it's not mandated for groundwater systems, but it is mandated for surface water systems. So yes, in the US, even a UV system, disinfection is done. If it is a surface water system or a groundwater under the influence of surface water, some chlorine residual is required. That is not true or has not been true in New Zealand. This table is from the New Zealand guidelines for drinking water management. I use it because it gives us a sense of um, the number of cases of various different <clears throat> um, waterborne diseases. You can see here and I haven't highlighted it, um, but the one that causes the most number of cases is actually Campylobacter. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So the other, and that's increasing, what we're seeing is a significant increase in <clears throat> disease caused by cryptosporidium or cryptospiridosis, you see an increase in giardias, gir, gir, waterborne diseases from giardia. Legionella, you see almost a doubling. Now Legionella is interesting because the Legionella is not from consuming drinking water, it's from inhaling water that contains the Legionella bacteria. So showering would be a likely route of exposure because during the shower, you the shower is producing small droplets, aerosolized particles, and then you have the potential to inhale those, partic those aerosol aerosolized particles containing Legionella. One of the concerns right now with COVID is that a lot of buildings have been closed. There's the potential for Legionella to proliferate in these stagnant piping systems. And then what do we do to make sure that we protect this population from exposure to Legionella once the building is open? And then lastly, you see VTEC and STEC. These are V for virotoxin and the S for shigatoxin. These are from E. coli. So these are the E. coli strains, as I mentioned, 0157 is one of them. And you see an increase in numbers there too. This is indicative of what we see across the world. It's the same, same thing in the US. This is a table, it's from the same document, on documented waterborne outbreaks. So you can see Campylobacter, 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 another one. I said 0157, I apologize, it's not, it was Campylobacter that was the cause of the Havelock North outbreak. What's the source? 
Anybody want to venture to? Anybody know anything about New Zealand? About New Zealand? Agriculture is extremely important. Um, in fact, at one point, I think there was 30 sheep for every one person. It's now about seven sheep for every one person in New Zealand. Um, so you have a significant <clears throat> agricultural industry, both sheep, um, dairy, and to some extent, um, swine. You have a significant amount of manure that has to be dealt with. If that manure gets into the drinking water system, there is the potential exposure. So Campylobacter is found in the guts of birds, especially poultry, cattle, sheep, cats, dogs. And if the food becomes contaminated, then it causes illness. In the US, it's believed to result in about 1.5 million illnesses per year. It's a gram negative bacteria and it's the most common cause of diarrheal illness in the US. So looking at drinking water regulations, it might be surprising to you to realize that it wasn't until 1986, 34 years ago, that all public water supplies are required to disinfect. Groundwater systems are required to disinfect. They're not required to maintain a disinfection residual because that the requirement to maintain disinfection residuals is under the surface water treatment rule. So in 1989, the, this rule was promulgated and the goal was to protect against Giardia, viruses and Legionella. The goal was to inactivate 99.9% .9 of Giardia and Giardia has a cyst, and 99.99% of viruses. This we will talk about as four log removal. So you'll see, we'll talk about this later in the tables for disinfection, and this is three log removal. The Stage one disinfection and disinfection byproduct rule was not promulgated until 1998. And that set maximum contaminant levels for trihalomethanes, haloacetic acids, bromate, and chloride. And we'll look more at these as we look at various different disinfectants, but it's relatively recent that we had regulations in the US for disinfection byproducts. And for instance, with the trihalomethanes, <clears throat> actually, and haloacetic acids and bromate, these are either known carcinogens or suspected carcinogens in humans. The contaminant levels are set based on ingestion. They are not <clears throat> set considering inhalation. It's purely ingestion. Also set maximum contaminant residuals for chlorine, chloramines, and chlorine di dioxide. So prior to that, <clears throat> there was no maximum residual set in the US. The interim surface water, enhanced surface water treatment rule in 2002, after the Milwaukee incident, mandated the removal of cryptosporidium. And that was at two log removal. 
the in 2006, the stage two disinfectant and disinfection byproduct rule changed the monitoring to reduce disinfection byproduct maximum. So the way we monitor for disinfection byproducts is quarterly and it's in the distribution system at locations where based on knowledge of the distribution system and hydraulic modeling, the water age is likely to be the highest, which means that there's a greatest potential for formation of disinfection byproducts. The longer the water is in the distribution system, the greater the opportunity for these reactions to occur and the more likelihood of higher concentrations. It also reduced the levels from total trihalomethanes to 80 and haloacetic acids, and there's five of them, to 60. And the way this is measured is with a, what's referred to as a longitudinal locational average. So for instance, in Flint, back in 20, December of 2014, the city of Flint had been monitoring and they had very high levels of trihalomethanes in a number of locations. The Ben Eagle issued a warning to the city that they needed to adjust their treatment system to reduce their levels. They hadn't yet exceeded the regulatory limit because there hadn't been force at quarters of measurements, but they wouldn't exceed the limit if they didn't change their water treatment system, which they did, and they did bring down the levels. <clears throat> the long-term to enhance surface water treatment rule set limits for the removal of crypto based on the number of oocysts in the rural water. And this is in terms of log removal. So this changed back in 2002, it was only two log removal. And in 2006, that was increased to at least four or five log removal. And that's based on the treatment used and then allocation. And that's based on the sampling. So when we go through this, it'll make a little more sense when we actually work through the problem, uh, the example problem. But based on the water quality and at least 24 months of sampling, one me <clears throat> measures mo or monitors the source water for cryptosporidium based on the levels observed, the water source water is placed into what we call bin. And that mandates the level of removal. Another fact about Flint was if you don't do the sampling, you're automatically in the highest bin in bin four. For some reason, and it's never been clear to me why, they neither did the sampling, nor were they placed, the, the source water placed in bin four, as was initially stated in some of the documents before they switched water. Now in New Zealand, the regulations are different. They did initially, they monitored for fecal coliforms, and that was an indicator of fecal contamination. So coliforms are a type of gram-negative bacteria. They have replaced uh, um, that with E. coli. So they're actually measuring E. coli directly. They have, including, they have included cryptosporidium in the compliance section. They have introduced monitoring requirements for ozone and 
chlorine dioxide disinfection to meet these requirements. And they removed giardia from the CT tables when using chlorine. And the reason they did that is because cryptosporidium is much more resistant to chlorination than is giardia. So if you can show that you've got sufficient inactivation of cryptosporidium oocyst, you would have inactivation, sufficient inactivation of giardia. So it was just con considered redundant because it's much more, giardia is more susceptible to chlorination than is crypto. Just to give you a sense of the importance of chlorination, it's actually been considered one of the most significant medical breakthroughs in the world. We don't think, see it as a medical breakthrough, but it had a significant impact on human health. In 1905, filtration was first implemented routine in the US, Philadelphia. And then in about 1908, chlorination was begun. And you can see that between filtration and chlorination, there has been a significant decrease in the death rate of typhoid fever. And this is before the introduction of penicillin and other antibiotics. So it really is the treatment of water that has had a significant impact. This table of compared disinfection efficacy in New Zealand and the US. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but you can see that there are differences. So for instance, in the US, for bacteria, it stated that less than 5% of samples can be positive for total coliforms in a month. And actually in the summer of 2014 in Flint, that value was much higher than 5%. If there is a total coliform positive, then that sample or that location must be analyzed for fecal coliforms or E. coli. In New Zealand, it's set as one E. coli per 100 ml. So it's not this percentage in a month. New Zealand has no regulations um, for viruses. The US has four log removal. In New Zealand, for crypto, and it's based on crypto, um, <clears throat> then less than one, in act, uh, one infective oocyst per 100 liters. The US, we're basing it on Giardia. We want three log removal or inactivation. And we control crypto predominantly by watershed protection. And Legionella, there is actually no regulations for Legionella in New Zealand or the US. The assumption is that if we protect against Giardia and viruses, then Legionella will be controlled. And we could talk in depth about whether or not that is a good assumption or not. So let's just look at the properties of disinfectants. And we're going to, I want to divide this and we'll talk first about water. And then we'll talk about wastewater. So when you're looking at a disinfectant, what properties do we want for water treatment? 
and you can either use the chat or if you want to unmute yourself, that works too. What properties are we what properties do we want for disinfectants? Um, could it be that it's like able to be consumed by humans? Okay, so we want something that is non-toxic. Absolutely. It makes no sense to disinfect with something that is toxic. What else? Most of Europe or much of Europe uses ozone and not chlorine. Anyone know why? You talked early on about water being palatable and potable. Much of Europe, they don't like the taste of chlorine, so they use ozone. Um, something that is readily reactive, exactly, okay? It has to react or destroy the pathogens that are present. So mentioned, cryptosporidium is extremely resistant to chlorine. So if there's crypto in the source water, that's a problem. It has to be able to inactivate or kill the pathogens present. And the reason we use inactivate is because for instance, viruses are not alive. So it's kind of, kill doesn't make sense. So that's inactivate is typically the term that's used. So it has to do this over the P, over the temperature range of the water. In Flint, while they were treating Flint River water, that temperature of the Flint River water ranged from two degrees C to 23. It has to be effective over that range. The pH range, it has to be effective at variable concentration or composition. Anything else? What else would we want? Good question. Other than being more palatable, are there other reasons to use ozone instead of chlorine? Ozone is much more effective at inactivating crypto, viruses, and giardia. It's a much stronger oxidant than chlorine. It doesn't produce dechlorinated disinfection byproducts. It does produce if there's bromide in water, so bromide, that bromide can react with ozone to produce bromate, and that is regulated at 10 micrograms per liter. So when we look at the example, you'll see we'll talk about bromide. But major reasons, much stronger oxidant than ozone, much more effective at inactivating cryptoviruses and giardia than is chlorine. Other reasons we might want to, or other properties we would want of a disinfectant. It has to be cost effective. People don't want to pay a lot for water. It has to be safe 
to transport, store, handle, and apply. So for instance, we'll talk about gaseous chlorine. The East Lansing Meridian Township plant used gaseous chlorine until there was a significant amount of development around that plant. And there was concerns about storing chlorine gas and the potential, the impact if there were a leak on the residents in the area. So they switched to liquid chlorine, hypochlorite. We need to be able to determine a residual. So this residual has to be easy to determine and inexpensive. And we will talk about primary disinfection and secondary disinfection. We'll talk with secondary disinfection. Here we're not, we're looking at <clears throat> maintaining a residual. in the distribution system. So primary disinfection, we're looking at inactivating the organisms, any pathogens. Secondary disinfection, we're looking at maintaining a residual. Now, if we talk about wastewater, What properties would we want for wastewater? Those of you in 480, we did an experiment where we looked at chlorine decay. Why did we care about chlorine decay? Okay, we wanna remove bacteria. So the same thing. We want to kill the bacteria. We want pathogen act inactivation. Why did we worry about and why did we design a dechlorination basin? Those of you in 480, 480. Lab two was all about the kinetic, determining the, kinetic, the kinetics and designing a, a dechlorination basin. Why did we design that dechlorination basin? Why didn't we just discharge wastewater with chlorine? We don't want a residual. Why? Because we don't want to kill the natural organisms in a receiving body of water. So the whole purpose of that dechlorination basin was to ensure that there wasn't a residual. What other properties do we want for wastewater? It also needs to be cost-effective and it needs to be safe for transport, storage, handling, and application. The last thing is we don't want byproducts that are toxic. So we don't want we don't want organisms to be in the ecosystem to be adversely affected. So we want to ensure that we are killing these bacteria or inactivating pathogens, but we don't want to adversely affect the ecosystem and the receiving body of water. So this gives you some sense of what we're looking for in terms of properties and how we will make decisions about the disinfectants.
So we're going to look at, we'll start looking at a number of disinfectants. The first one is chlorine. One of the things I want to make sure, okay, when we're talking about chlorine, we're talking about chlorine gas, aqueous dissolved chlorine gas, hypochlorous acid, and hypochlorite. We are not talking about chloride. <clears throat> chloride, yes, at very high concentrations, would be a disinfectant. Um, it would kill fresh water or organisms that survive in fresh water. However, to accomplish that, the levels would be so high that that water would not be drinkable. So these are the, the four species we're talking about when we talk about chlorine. <clears throat> so we can apply it as chlorine gas. You see the gas tanks here. We can apply it as liquid, basically bleach, or calcium hypochlorite, which is a solid tablet. And if those of you have a swimming pool and you add the solid tablets to the pool to disinfect, what you're adding is calcium hypochlorite. Here, already the experiment we did was with bleach and sodium hypochlorite, bleach that you use to bleach clothes. gives you some idea of the application. So in this case, you can see here is our effluent. This is similar to what you'd see in a wastewater plant. And you've got a chlorine mixer and you've got a chlorine contact diffuser, it's adding the chlorine and a contact chamber. In this case here, you, again, it's with wastewater. You've got a Venturi injector, and you are injecting right into the pipeline and mixing in this turbulent region here in order to disperse the chlorine gas. Now, if we add chlorine gas to water, so we, we inject chlorine gas, some of that will dissolve to form aqueous chlorine. That aqueous chlorine reacts with water to form hypochlorous acid. Notice it releases H plus, so it's going to lower the pH and chloride. And this reaction is very rapid. It's complete within a few milliseconds. Hypochlorous acid can dissociate, okay, releasing proton, forming hy hypochlorite, but hypochlorous acid is about 80 to 100 times more effective than hypochlorite for killing E. coli. So that means that our dose is pH dependent. So in order to get the same level of treatment, we're going to need more chlorine added at a higher pH. We talk about free available chlorine, and that is the sum of hypochlorous acid, hypochlorite, and aqueous chlorine. So kind of those of you in 480, when we measured that chlorine decay lab, you measured free available chlorine. This is what you were measuring. We'll stop here and we'll talk a little bit more on chlorine reactions on Wednesday and other disinfectants.